Hey guys, it's Adam from Nusa Pixel and welcome back. Now today's topic comes to you uh, from a question that I've received not from one student, but by dozens and dozens of students. It's a very common question, one which I have had to ask myself many times in my own career, and one which many of my students come to me with very often. And that's the question, am I good enough to work professionally? Are my skills up to par to work professionally? And you'd think, you'd think that that would be a very straightforward, easy answer. You compare your artwork to other professionals and fit yourself in there somewhere, right? But it's not. It's not a straightforward answer. It can be convoluted. It can be confusing. Getting the answers you're looking for can be very difficult. And there's more than one factor that plays into very often our inability or our great challenge in gauging ourselves as professionals. The first one being the technical one, the fundamental one having those fundamental skills, having an understanding of the artistic fundamentals well enough to be able to be able to perform a job professionally, be able to execute what a client or a director is asking for effectively in order to um, make them happy, in order to deliver to them something that they're happy enough to pay you for, not only once, but multiple times, AKA employment, <laughs> right? But it's not that easy because as artists, one of the interesting things that art teaches you is that very often what you are struggling to do, you're struggling to do because you don't know what's missing. You look at your art and then you look at the art of other people that you see online or your friends or whatever. And you like what they're doing and you can see the strength in their artwork and you want to do something to that same level. And then you go back to the drawing board and you sit down in front of your computer and you try to do the drawing yourself and something's missing. You just, you just can't do it. And this isn't something exclusive to you, by the way, who's listening to me. I feel this every single day. I guarantee you that every one of the artists that you watch online, Boro Dante and Marco Bucci and Tyler Edlin and, and Cynics and, and Clint Kearley and Ethan Becker and all these different artists, I bet you every single one of them feel the same way, that they aspire to be something better, to be able to accomplish something better, but don't know how to yet. And one of the things you might notice is very often the artists that tend to grow the fastest, find the best improvement, are artists that aren't only exposed to their own opinion of their work, but also exposed to the other people's opinions as well. A good example would be Bobby Chu or Sam Nielsen or Steven Silver or Nathan Fawkes. <clears throat> what do all of these artists have in common? Well, they work together. <laughs> they all teach at Schoolism. And one of the wonderful things that Bobby had developed with Schoolism isn't only this platform for teaching and all these and, and exposing artists to all these different uh, uh, fantastic skills like Daisy Tsutsumi, for instance. It's the fact that they collaborate together. They go on workshops together. They, they talk behind the scenes. You, you're pretty, I'm pretty sure they talk behind the scenes because it gives them the opportunity to be able to share other opinions with other people. I've said this very often in my, in my art talks before in the past, one person's skill versus somebody else's skill is not a linear comparison because we all walk into art from different doors. Some people come in from fine arts, some come from surrealism, some come from design, some people come from graphic design, some people come from industrial design, some come, people come from illustration, some people come from fantasy art, some people come from animation. And every one of these different facets of art starts you off and focus on certain particular strengths. In animation, I developed the ability to draw three-dimensional form, consistency, uh, exaggeration, weight, drama, expression, clothes costume design, facial character design. These are all things that, that I developed very early on in my career. 
but things like color, form, value, environment design, etc. were things that I put aside. They weren't as mandatory. So as artists, we have a certain set of skills that we've exposed ourselves to, certain fundamentals that we tend to prioritize more than others. And because our career focuses us so much in a certain direction, we are in some, in some cases weaker in other areas or in other cases completely blind to certain other principles that we very often won't even pick up or even understand until somebody points it out to us. So if I was to show my art to, for instance, Daisy Tsutsumi, or if I showed my art, my art to my friend Tyler, which I do all the time, every time I show my artwork to Tyler, he always gives me a fresh perspective on my work. He sees things I don't see. His vision is very unique from my own. And very often things that I might get completely roadblocked with, all of a sudden he spots it right away and he points it out and immediately kind of gets the, the stick out from my spokes and the wheels start turning again. I had to rework this Medusa painting multiple times and finally I found it. I had to kind of come back to my roots and rem remember what my original intention was and I'm finally happily excited about where this painting is going. What does this mean for you with regards to knowing whether or not you're good enough or knowing whether or not you have those fundamentals? You need more than one opinion of your work. It doesn't need to, you don't have to go and pay for a school necessarily, but just communicating with other artists, reaching out to other people, maybe on Instagram or different things like that and asking the question, what do you think? And getting people's feedback. But let me say that with a, with a little caveat, don't, don't go on generalized forums where there's 600 people sitting on the forum and ask them for opinion because you'll get 600 different perspectives. Remember I said every artist comes in from different angles. So if you ask a huge variety of different artists, a huge congregation of different artists to give you an opinion, it's going to immediately overwhelm you because everybody's going to focus on something else. Some people are going to tell you that your, your character design needs work. Some people are going to tell you that your line needs work. Some people are going to tell you that your perspective is off. Some people are going to tell you that your colors need fixing. You won't know your ass from your elbow by the time they're done with you. No, pick one or a few, a very small short list of people that can, that you trust, that understand what you're doing with your art. That's very important and ask them to give you a very objective perspective on your work. Not one that's overly sensitive to your personal feelings, not one that's that's tiptoeing around your ego. No, just saying, okay, this and this and this, these are things that you could definitely focus on. And they might very well introduce you to a principle, an artistic principle you didn't even, even know existed, or one that you did know existed, but took completely for granted and didn't realize it was actually important, okay? That's a big one. So getting an outsider's opinion, a small short list of trusted people is a wonderful resource for you and one which I really recommend you tap into because otherwise you can sit there and slam your head against a table for weeks, months, or years and maybe hopefully eventually find the answer when in fact you could have asked somebody and gotten to that answer right away. Does that mean you're going to instantly improve? No but it means you're going to get control of your art back. You're going to know what the problem is. I like, I like comparing it to illness. Truly having an illness, truly being sick, truly being injured versus worrying about being sick, AKA health anxiety. You get a little, oh, you get a little pinch in your chest. And you're like, oh, is it my heart? Oh my God, go quick, take an EKG, check your blood pressure. You know, oh, oh, my back. Uh oh, did I slip a disc? Did I herniate a disc? Oh no. And you go and you check things out. Every little, every little sneeze and itch and tweak and pinch makes you panic because it's the fear of what if, but which is a very stressful place to be in, right? When you don't know what the problem is, but then you get the flu and you just flat out get sick and you're sneezing and coughing and you've got a fever and you feel like shit and you're exhausted and you lie in bed sweating it out for, for three days straight. What's harder to live with? The fear that it could be something terrible or just knowing you're sick and you got to wait it out for a couple of days and sweat it out. Knowing what the issue is is far less painful 
because you have control. You own that issue and you can fix it versus sitting there staring at a piece of artwork that just doesn't feel right to you, but not having an answer. But there's another side to this, and it's a more personal side. It's what you expose yourself to. I can't stress enough how much social media alters your perception of your worth. And I'm not talking about the social dilemma thing. You know, I've seen that documentary too, where, uh, you know, or it, it, it warps your perception of your beauty or your talent or any of those things. I'm not talking about that. It also very much warps your perception of your artistic skill in more ways than you might imagine. Take my video, for instance. This video of me painting that you're watching right now is messing with your perception of your own art. I had to edit this video this way, otherwise, well, you'd be you'd get very bored very fast because this video would end up being 20 hours long. And of course, I have a life, right? So when you're looking at it, understand the fact that you're looking at a video that was heavily edited. And I also picked the best parts of this process of painting this Medusa painting. Thankfully, thanks to artists like Borodante, I have the courage to be able to post my mistake. That you can actually see, this is the third, my third direction I've gone with this painting. Now, not all my paintings get derailed as much as this one does, but this one definitely did get derailed. This one challenged me because I was trying to grow. I was trying to, I was trying to achieve something new. But what you're looking at it is a video that is sometimes 200, 300, 400 times the speed that it actually is. It's 500% the speed of the original video. If I bring this back down to regular speed, you realize how it'll feel like it's at a snail's pace. It'll feel like my progress is almost static. But that's my normal speed. I'm a very slow, thoughtful artist. You're also not noticing all the breaks I took. Sometimes I paint for half an hour. Sometimes I paint for two hours. Sometimes I paint for 15 minutes and then I got to put it down and the doorbell rings and I have to answer an email. All these little distractions happen. But you're all, you're seeing one fluid 20, 30 minute painting video that's time-lapsed. It looks like, well, Adam's just got his shit entirely together, but I don't. It's a lot of trial and error. There's a lot of experimentation. There's a lot of trying certain things out and it doesn't. There's a lot of breaks. There's a lot of thoughtfulness. There's a lot of going and having lunch and making myself a coffee's in the middle of this process. But you're not seeing that. And you need to understand that greatness, achieving something great is something that takes time, is something that takes patience. It's something that, that requires you sometimes to be able to to get over your frustrations, to be able to swallow your ego, or as Marco Bucci would say it, you have to murder your babies, right? Sometimes if you're in love with an idea, but that idea is holding you, holding back the big process, so you have to pull it out of the equation to allow everything else to fall into place. That's real life. That's the real tempo of life. And social media, for better or for worse, intentionally or not, is designed in a way to compress and idealize the world you're looking at. Furthermore, people generally will only expose themselves publicly when they feel confident enough to do that. And getting back to what I started this whole conversation about where my students coming up to me and asking me if they feel I'm qualified enough to work professionally. Sometimes I'll be very objective and I'll say, well, you still need to work on this and this and get this. You go, this is strong, but you need to work on that. Sometimes it's objective, but more often than not, I'll turn to them and ask them the question, why are you even asking me that question? <laughs> and they'll kind of look at me like, what, did I say something wrong? And I'll, I'll say, why are you even asking me that question? You're one of the, one of the most talented artists I've ever worked with. Sometimes these artists are better than me. They, they've got more experience than me. And they're asking me if I feel they're qualified enough to work professionally. And I'll usually laugh or smirk at them and I'll say, you're way overqualified to work professionally. You've got skill beyond skill. I don't know why you haven't started working professionally yet, but I know people that started working professionally when they, when they had one fifteenth your talent. 
and one must wonder why they feel that way. One must ask the question why they have a hard time accepting the fact that they're good enough. Well, it's because of social media. It's because when they look, when you look at splash art for League of Legends, if you look at the, if you look at the splash art for, for World of Warcraft or for Game of Thrones, or you look at all the book reviews that I do, all this gorgeous stuff for Cyberpunk or for Horizon Zero Dawn or The Last of Us or Assassin's Creed or Dragon Age or, or Diablo or any of these different things, understand that to shortlist that little book of, of, of really nice looking paintings that, that they've presented to their public, there are 18,000 meh drawings. There's the scrap, there's the attempts, there's the trials, there's the, the failures, there's the edits, there's all of this stuff. I remember when I was working on the Disney show, one of my first jobs, was I worked on the uh, Monsters, Inc. video game for the PlayStation. And I remember the early reels. One of the cool things about working on this game is we got these, these like, we got... Uh, early access to some clip uh, clips from the game and stuff like that. We were under NDA and we couldn't talk about it. And I remember looking at it and thinking to myself, "My God, that scene couldn't possibly get better." I remember that that like one of the cutest scenes where where uh, Mike and Sully are trying to quarantine their their uh, the their apartment while Boo goes around and and knocks everything over and he's holding her with a with a broom, you know, trying to keep and disinfecting everything that she touches. I saw that scene and thought to myself, my God, that is probably the cutest, funniest scene I've ever seen in any movie ever. It's the best thing ever. They couldn't, how could you possibly make anything better than that? And every single week they would send us updates of these reels. Every single week they would send us more and more updates. They would make little tiny micro tweaks to those scenes. They continued this through the entire year and a half process that I was working on this game. And every single time they sent me an update, I went, oh, they nailed it. That's it. That's perfect. Couldn't get any better. And I kept saying that over and over again, every single week for the over a year. <laughs> they always saw room for improvement. There was always a place to improve. There was always somewhere to go. And Brad Bird said it perfectly. He said when he was working on The Incredibles, the experience is, it's like just one more little, come on, just, uh, just trying to get the little tweak and then bam, they slam the door in your face. They have to slam the door on your hands to keep you from, from drawing any further. It's just, it's fine. Just, just release the damn film because there's always space for improvement. But all you ever see is the best of the best. That's all people will ever present to you. And that's warping your perception on what got them that great painting in the first place. That warps your perception on all of the crappy drawings they did that they were embarrassed about, that they wouldn't dare show anybody, that got to them finally figuring it out. You're going, ah, there it is. And that's exactly what I did with the Medusa painting. I looked at some Frazetta art. I looked at some art by Brahm. I looked at some different paintings. You might even recognize some of my color choices and some of my lighting choices inspired by these different artists. I needed to step outside of my own confused brain and look at a piece of artwork that answered some of the questions I was looking for and use that and objectively look back at my own artwork. I did it on my own. It's not easy to do. And I looked back at my own artwork and I went, that's it. That's where I, that's where I was falling short. And that broke me through the mold. So understand the process that, understand the fact that I'm full of doubt. I question myself all the time. Sometimes I don't have the answers and sometimes I have to go and ask other people. Sometimes asking other people will throw me off base because it, it, tarnishes my original vision and it kind of gets overpowered by somebody else's great vision. I'm a very normal organic human being that screws things up on a daily basis. How often it, these art talks that I do, a lot of my friends say, how do you do it all in one take like this? Well, you know how I do it in one take? I do it in one take by doing it in 30 takes. You can ask anybody in my family. The fact that I can sit here all day and re-record this thing 50 times because I lose my trail of thought or I feel I took an angle that made me, that kind of lost the point or I ramble off in a certain direction, just like I'm doing right now. And then eventually it kind of comes back, it all culminates into this fluid thought, but that fluid thought is a manifestation of 30 attempts. If I, when I look at my audio files, how many audio files that I go through recording this, I upload 
the final one, but I, it can be version 47. But you're seeing the final version. You're seeing, you're listening right now to recording number 46. Understand that. You're not listening to recording number one. Take that and take what I'm saying and apply that to yourself. You are scrutinizing your ability. You're questioning your ability because all you see is other people's idealized, edited successes. But you're not seeing the 7,000 mistakes, retrials, frustrations, interruptions, screw ups, tangents, etc., etc., etc. Give yourself permission to be patient, to take your time, to do what you need to do, to start over, to hit the drawing board again, and so they say, and start everything from scratch. And if and when you find yourself completely at a complete utter loss, and you know that you want things to be better, but you just can't bloody figure it out because you just, there's something missing in your knowledge base in your brain, reach out to one or two people that you trust that can help you to get that stick out of your spokes, just like my friends do for me all the time. All right, so with that said, I love you all with all my heart and happy painting. Take care.